I grew up around the incredible North American Great Lakes, and I tried to spend as much time as possible playing with water. In the summers, my family vacationed on Lake Huron, and we still do. Here I am at four years old with my little net meant for catching butterflies, but that I found worked equally well for scooping up the little animals and plants from the lake. My sister and I would spend hours trapping whatever we could catch from little crayfish to minnows to tadpoles, and we would put them in our mom's wash basins and we would watch them. Now, during the rest of the year, I was forced to go to school while waiting around for that next summer. And after school, I um, took piano and voice lessons, played in the marching band, sang in the choir. Little did I know at the time that I would remain in school for the rest of my life. <laughs> and little did I know I would get to have this career where I get to spend my time in lakes studying their little plants and animals. Who knew that was even possible? And I never could have guessed that these two passions of mine, water and music, would come together in my professional life. Well, now I'm a freshwater ecologist and I study lakes and wetlands for a living. We all know that the world is changing, right? It's changing so much and it's changing so fast. Well, it turns out that lakes are just our best sentinels of these changes. They tell us what's going on with the planet. These two lakes are sending us different messages. The lake on the right is one that I got to visit in China. It's a lake that has these massive blooms of toxic blue-green algae. This is algae that is really threatening the freshwater and food supply of the seven million people that live around this lake. And we can contrast this to the lake on the left, which is um, beautiful subtropical Lake Annie. It's on the protected property of Archbold Biological Station up in south central Florida. My job as an aquatic scientist is to help figure out why do lakes look like this and how can we keep water looking like this lake on the left? And I get to do this with other aquatic scientists who share the same passion. I'm a member of the Global Lake Ecological Observatory Network, or GLEON. GLEON is comprised of scientists from all around the world who really care about lakes and their tech toys, in this case, these buoys. Buoys float on the lake's surface and they have all kinds of sensors that extend down into the water and those sensors collect data and those data are telling us what's going on in these lakes. And again, the lakes are telling us about the world. We just have to listen. Now, I take care of the buoy on Lake Annie. It's sort of a joint custody situation with the folks at the biological station who visit the buoy every month and record the data and help take care of the instruments. And um, the Lake Annie, like all the Glion buoys, has a string of thermometers that extend down from the top to the bottom of the 60-foot deep lake. And those thermometers are recording temperatures every 15 minutes, and they provide us information like this. This is a cross-section of a lake showing the distribution of water temperatures from top to bottom. And in this example, we have the warmer water coated as red, and the water gets colder and colder and colder as we go down deeper, and you can see that gradation from yellow to green to blue. And as we would expect in the summertime, the sun is warming up those surface waters, right? And the surface waters get a lot warmer than the bottom waters. And this is why when you go swimming in a lake in the summer, you can feel that cold water when you dangle your feet down deep. 
This is a heat map. It's the same kind of information, but it's the real data from Lake Annie extended over time, over a three-year period. And in this map of Lake Annie's water temperatures, we can see that surface water in the first part of the record getting redder and redder and redder, right, in the top. And that means that the water is getting warmer and warmer. And by the end of the summer, the water is the, losing heat to the atmosphere. And so we see the plot go from yellow to green. And that means that the lake is getting colder all the way from the top to the bottom. And this pattern is repeated each year. But each year is a little bit different depending on the climate. And it's those differences that we care about as scientists because that's what really matters to the little animals and plants living in the lake. And so I started digging into these differences in Lake Annie and looking at the details there and in some of the other Gleon lakes and noticed something interesting. Let's pull out the middle part of this record from the summer of 20, 2009 to this very cold winter of 2010. On top of this heat map, we have the actual weekly average temperature values from the top, middle, and bottom of the lake. And as a scientist, I looked at this and I saw the typical seasonal pattern and that cold spell that happened in the winter. But I also, as a musician, saw something else. I saw music. And so I couldn't help myself. I took the data and I took the average of all those water temperatures and I called that middle C on the piano. Oops. And I assigned for every degree warmer, one note higher. And for every degree colder, one note lower. And so with every temperature assigned to a note, we can actually listen to that transition from winter to summer in the surface waters of this lake. And it sounds like this. You can hear that transition as we go from winter to summer. And if we contrast that to the bottom waters that are cold all year round, we hear something like this, really static, low notes, until we get to that cold snap, which was the coldest freeze on record. And so I began listening to uh, music from the other Gleon Lakes, and I thought, what do these sound like? How are they different? What about Loch Fia? This is a lake in Ireland, also a Glean Lake with all these sensors in it, and I study that with some friends um, in Ireland. It's bathed by the North Sea, so it's really cold all year round compared to South Subtropical Lake Annie. And so this lake, I actually had to take the music and transpose it up an octave in order to put it on a musical score. Um, it sounds like this. almost like it's groaning, and it sounds like that all year round. <laughs> we can contrast that to a lake in Wisconsin that in Wisconsin experiences all seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall. Lake Mendota sounds like this. It has a massive transition in the seasons, and so in the surface waters, it goes like this. a much greater range of pitches than the other two lakes because it has that really distinct seasonality going on. So listening to data like this from lakes from different parts of the world really helped me understand those data better. And in fact, the lakes were singing to me. In addition to hearing the differences in the high and low temperatures, I could sense the pace and pattern of change. I could sense the degree to which these patterns were repeated or not across years. And so music just appears to be uniquely suited to expressing the complexity of nature. 
For example, here are a bunch of heat maps for the lakes that I showed you the buoys for earlier. Now, when we look at this, it seems like a huge amount of information. And if we combine these, this temperature data together with all of the other measurements being recorded, from the amount of algae in the water to the availability of oxygen to the amount of light that penetrates down through, all these different variables being measured at different depths every 15 minutes or so of every day of the year, and we multiply that by the hundreds of lakes that have sensors, well, this is what we call big data. How do we make sense of all that big data in order to know what's going on in the world? It's so important to be able to decipher the changes that are happening in nature so that we can work to solve our most critical global problems. Well, perhaps putting together scientific stories from really complicated data might not be that different from composing music. And Beethoven showed us this in his really complicated symphonies. If you look at a musical score, you see that it has a time signature that indicates the pace of change, and then it has key signatures, parts for different instruments, different tempos, adagios, uh, different movements, all of which are expressions of what's, what's trying to be conveyed and all of which tell us something about change and even enables us to anticipate change. And let me give you an example of that that I think you'll all relate to. We've all seen the movie Jaws, right? <laughs> everything's going along fine, we think everything's okay, but what is it that causes us to get really scared and anticipate that something's about to happen? Right? It's not that different for lakes. Researchers tell us that the human ear can discern differences and changes more acutely than the eye can see them. And for this reason, scientists and musicians from all around the world are coming together to explore data through music. And they're allowing nature to write songs like this. So for me, and perhaps for you, music might just be the best tool we have for exploring the complexities of nature. I feel so fortunate to be the director of a school at a major university that merges deliberately the environment and society with the arts. And so we're trying to use all of our senses to make sense of all of this information overload in this generation of big data. And we want our students to be able to engage with the world in all of its complexity. If they can understand it better, maybe they can be the change makers that our world so desperately needs. And perhaps by offering you a different way to understand nature, you too can interact with it in ways that create harmony and balance out of this rapidly changing world around us. And so now I'd like to leave you with three years of a song written in effect by Lake Annie and interpreted by me and arranged and performed by our FIU School of Music students. This is Lake Annie's song.